Okay, now, um, now that we've worked on proper time and we've worked on proper velocity, now let's take one step further and start looking at relativistic energy and momentum. Okay, so um, what we can do is maybe define a momentum like we normally would as a mass times a velocity, but now we're going to be using the proper time, the, the proper velocity. So for momentum, we're going to say the momentum is m nu mu. Okay. Um, so if I look at the three vector, if I just look at the x, y, and z components of my momentum, then I'm going to use the arrow for the three vector. And I would have the mass times the x, y, z components. And so this would be m u divided by the square root of 1 minus beta squared, which I can rewrite as gamma m u. So the interesting thing is that now I've written the relativistic three momentum, rel relativistic x, y, z components of the momentum in terms of a gamma times the mass times the ordinary velocity. And so this is, this is the kind of the, um, uh, the really subtle point is that um, the, you know, if you want to be totally relativistic, then just use the um, proper velocity. However, if you want to talk about just ordinary velocities, now you can use this equation, which is gamma times m. And that's why sometimes people take the gamma and they associate it with the m. And so then what you do is you come up with a relativistic momentum, I'm sorry, relativistic mass, where I now have gamma m, which is uh, 1 over 1 minus beta squared, square root. Um, the interesting thing is beta is always less than 1. That means the number of the denominator is less than 1, which means that the gamma, which is essentially what it is, is always greater than 1, which means my mass is now increasing with speed. So that's why you get this idea that the faster you go, the more your mass has now changed. Um, however, um, you could associate the gamma with the ordinary velocity, which is what we did in order to get the proper velocity. So I think it's better physic. It's a it's a better explanation if you just associate it with the proper velocity instead of trying to figure out is there some kind of relativistic change in my mass. Okay. Um, now with the time, so the momentum zeroth component of the momentum is the mass times a to zero, which is mc square root of one minus beta squared, or essentially gamma mc. So now this is kind of interesting because now we have a time um, component to the momentum. So we have a spatial component, three spatial components to the momentum, and one time component to the momentum. If I was to now, um, multiply this time component times c, then what I would get is mc squared, gamma mc squared, which I'm going to declare to be the relativistic energy. So now what I'm doing is I'm combining the uh, momentum and energy into one quantity, which you can call energy of momentum if you want, where the time component of the momentum is the energy. So at rest, then beta is equal to zero, which means that E is equal to, uh, beta is equal to zero, gamma is equal to one, E is equal to mc squared, where m is the rest mass. So we're not gonna do any kind of um, uh, transformation on the mass. But at rest, the, um, there is some amount of energy associated with each individual particle. 
So that's again why we call it energy, because if you take away the momentum, momentum is essentially related to motion. If I get rid of the motion, the object still has a certain amount of energy to it. Okay, so now if I want to consider the energy in the motion, which we call kinetic energy, So that kinetic energy, E kin, is the total energy minus its rest mass. Okay, so it looks like I'm doing something kind of weird, but what I've really done is say the total energy is gamma mc squared, so that's, that includes the momentum piece, minus the rest energy, which I get gamma minus 1 times mc squared. So the relativistic kinetic energy is this term right here, which I can write out as mc squared 1 over 1 minus beta squared square root minus 1. And so now what I can do is I can do, let's say we do an um, expansion of it. So if we expand 1 minus beta squared to the minus 1 half power, and what I get is 1 plus 1 half beta squared plus dot dot dot. So that means my relativistic kinetic energy is mc squared 1 plus 1 half beta squared minus oh, plus dot 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 minus 1. The 1 and the minus 1 cancel and I'm left with mc squared times one half beta squared plus dot 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 um, and beta is V I'm sorry not V U U squared over C squared which is approximately one half the mass times the velocity squared, where I've now dropped off, I can drop off the higher terms if u is much, much less than c, then what I get is the non-relativistic kinetic energy that you've been using for all of your life. So that gives us some um, credibility for this equation that the relativistic kinetic energy is gamma minus 1 mc squared um, because in the slow in the low speed approximation then what you get is the non-relativistic kinetic energy so now what we'll do is we'll look at the um, invariant um, energy and momentum so if we calculate the invariant um, interval So we essentially take the energy momentum and square it. Then what we should get is minus P0, not P0, 0 in the upper index, squared plus P1 squared plus P2 squared plus P3 squared. And um, I could rewrite that. I could rewrite that as minus p zero squared plus p squared, where now from the Pythagorean theorem, p squared is equal to p x squared plus p y squared plus p z squared, and that now minus p zero squared plus the total momentum squared is equal to minus the mass squared times c squared. And what I notice is that I can plug in for p0, I can plug in the total energy, so I get minus the total energy over c quantity squared plus p squared is equal to minus m squared c squared. If I now multiply c squared on all sides, I get minus 
e squared plus pc quantity squared equal to minus m squared c to the fourth. And so can I rearrange it so it looks a little bit neater? What I have is e squared minus pc quantity squared is equal to m squared c fourth or m uh, c squared squared and so now I have the total energy squared is equal to the momentum times c quantity squared plus the mass times c squared that squared and so what we get is in the end the relativistic total energy and so this is um, basically similar to what we had before with the spatial stuff which said that is equal to minus ct squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared so it's interesting now that the um, space-time and the space-time energy are now um, of a similar form. So it, essentially what it is, is the Pythagorean theorem, is that what we have now is an energy, E, um, and we have the um, rest mass, and we have the um, momentum. Um, components. And so this length here, no matter what frame you're in, is always going to be invariant. There's always going to be a total amount of energy in the system. Um, and no matter how you um, define your frame, this length here, the total amount of energy, is going to be the same. It's going to be invariant. What's going to change is how much of the reaction do you see is, is with the fraction in the momentum and with the fraction in the rest mass. Some places there may be more rest mass and less momentum, and other places there could be more momentum and less rest mass. And that leads to essentially um, particle reactions where one particle can be very massive and have not a lot of momentum, and then it decays into smaller particles with less mass and more momentum.